sure it would have been cool and to have the money that they were going to give and have 150 kids and the whole nine and have a big beautiful school and all that like on tv and all that i would have rather had my nine students that i got now versus that 150 because i wanted to see those children actually being developed um sure they can be learning better or whatever like that but i want to see their whole lives change not their grades um and that's why i didn't decide to go charter i i firmly believe in like i said before fighting for young black men before they die not while they're dead and just sending them to school it's not gonna cut it for me We gon' top bids on this one here. Know what I'm talking about? Big, big. Fuck this, man. It's crazy. I heard investment make the four up list. Amazon, the rock nation made investments to sell. Go buy the building, don't be worried about it. Door split. Even if the mission get hard, you can't afford it. You see me getting money, well, I'm just expressing myself. It's harder building on your own, you always welcome to help. Build a mastermind who works in the pony and heal. You know Alright, we back for another episode of Change Agents. I'm Trav. This is Kevin. And today we have my spoiled little brother who just so happens to be pretty good at what he does, King Randall. What's up, boss? What's up, Doc? I've been trying to get you here for like a year. It's been a minute. It's <laughs> been a what? minute. It's kind of crazy. The school just opened, so I'm busy. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, <laughs> that's your only excuse. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for those who don't know, give you a whole little rundown. I can, I can almost quote it, but go ahead. Nah, you do it, and then I'll catch you. I'm King Randall from the Actual Boys. Mm -hmm. um, I started a program when I was 19 years old out of my house. Mm -hmm. I went to... No, nah, I'm just playing. Go ahead. That was it. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yep, I'm King Randall, the founder of the Actual Boys program in the Life Preparatory School for Boys. Um, I don't want to give too much because I know we're going to start asking some questions, um, but I opened a school for boys in Albany, Georgia, teaching them how to work on cars, houses, uh, doing many different things, uh, but I want to get into it, so I don't want to ramble. So, like, you know... Just your story has always been inspiring to me, bro. Like, just really, you know, I come from Santa's, but you born and, mm -hmm. you know, raised in Albany, Georgia. Just, like, we we don't really get, like, access to rooms and people that really, like, can show us what their next step is, even mm -hmm. if they don't see it. Right. And that's essentially what you're doing, and that's what we're doing with our space. So, you know, that was always inspiring. But, like, what made you get to start? you know, with the school? Like, yeah. what was that foundation like for you? Um, so when I first um, started the program originally, yeah. uh, one of my classmates had got sentenced 30 years in prison. Yeah. And um, it, aside from the story of what happened, we didn't have any rehab programs that mm. I thought were sufficient for young boys. Helping them, yeah. Um, and the only rehab program they had was called uh, Functional Family Therapy, where mm. they meet uh, for three months for once a week for an hour online. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah, but that was the rehab program that's spending seven thousand dollars a year on. Yeah, yeah, and I thought that was stupid. I'm just like, right. this is not real rehab. They need true consistency. Yeah, yeah. So immediately after that, um, I, I, from my house, I started telling parents, you know, online, like, hey, yeah. I can start taking kids on field trips. I made little ugly flyers on my phone. Yeah, put them on Facebook, and you know, I started getting kids like that. And right now, I'm so. Sometimes I just think about those parents and just so grateful mm. for them even trusting a 19 year old kid at that time to teach their kids, you know, how to work on cars and houses and take them on field trips and whatever. Um, but they saw changes in their children and that's why they kept um, sending them back. And the kids right. always wanted to come back. And that's something I was happy about. But that's kind of where I got the idea from just wanting to see something and just doing it. Yeah. Um, instead of making excuses like many people do, I just decided to mm. just do it. What's the number one thing you think kids need these days? Consistency. Um, yeah. Consistency is what they need um, and environment change. Um, mm. And then both of them have to go hand in hand. Um, it, they have to remove themselves from their environment and then get some consistency and mm. discipline. Mm. Um, and, and in who they are um, and, and building habits and routines, all of that is inconsistency. Habits build character and character makes the man. Yeah. Um, that's what I believe in. So if they're having constant things they're doing every day, working yeah. out, uh, reading, just stuff you should know how to do. It'll be second nature once you become an adult. You're just mm. used to getting up early. You're used to mm. going to do stuff. You're used to working. You're used to working to eat. You're used to talking to people properly, right. giving the proper greeting of the day, right. speaking to people, knowing right. how to say your name, sitting mm. up straight, all these different habits that they should build. So mm. when they get older, it's just like second nature. It's nothing to them. Right. So that's, yeah, I would say uh, consistency and environment change. Got you. Um, and what's been... What's been the greatest story or greatest experience that you've had, you know, working with the boys mm. so far? Best and worst, actually. 
<laughs> um, that's a that's a good question, man. Um, we've had a lot of great stories with our students. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had bad stories too. You know, every parent ain't got the, the best thing to say. Yeah. You know about the program. Um, I'm not perfect, and you know the program ain't perfect either. Especially when I first started out, I was 19. I yeah. have no logistics down. Yeah. No no allergy right. information. Yeah. No forms. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, we just out yeah. on field trips and yeah. doing whatever, you yeah. know. So, and that was, that was a learning experience for me, you know. And some things happened, and nothing like crazy or nothing. Yeah, like that, yeah, but yeah. Some things happened, you know. Parents weren't happy about it. And right, I had to fix right. it and yeah. learn. So now I have staff now that help with yeah. those things. But um, I wouldn't. It's like the, just running the program in itself has been the best experience. Just learning because we've saved so many kids from mm. so many different bad environments on top of. Um, watching them change themselves, you know, as young men and, and becoming better and then listening to their moms talk about how right. they've changed and listening to their, you know, grandparents or whoever's raising them, mm -hmm. see how they've changed. Yeah. Um, and that's what we want to see. I know I got kids that have graduated um, from high school, they're in college now, and mm -hmm. to have them call me back, you know, and say they appreciate all the stuff I was trying to show them. Yeah. You know, I've had four or five phone calls, you know, from all the kids that I was helping since I was, yeah. you know, 19. And, they call him like Mr. King, like, I really understand all that stuff you was trying to tell us now. Yeah. You know, and 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 that's that I think that's one of the best things to me, like he hearing those kids call back or even one of the kids I, I yeah. had to kick out, like my first kid I ever had to kick out um back in 2020. He called me like 2022, um, last year. And he called me, wow. he was just like, Mr. King, he was like, All that stuff you was trying to tell me, because yeah. he's he's adult now. Yeah. And he was like, I appreciate everything you was trying to tell me, and I remember everything you was trying to say. And I I'm sorry for how I acted at that time, but everything that you said to me and everything that you were trying to teach me, I appreciate it now, you know, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I always tell them like, you'll get it later. But right, as of right. right now, you got to do what you're supposed to do. So. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, that's mm -hmm. powerful, bro. Um, you know, just seeing somebody really taking a grasp on their own community and making real change is like just so big, you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. it don't really take a lot, like, you know, and, and on that note, like, I just want you to speak to what are some ways that, you know, a lot of parents, mm -hmm. people in the community, um, even students, like what are some things that they can do to really bring change immediately for them? Right. Um, my first thing is do something. Yeah. Um, cause a lot of people are doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I say that because people think that they have to be doing something grand right. scale. Right. They gotta be right. opening schools yeah. or opening soup kitchens and all that. I'm like, you don't have to do all that. You can find a family to feed. You can get a homeless person some money, <laughs> you know, right. that you've been right. selling right. no for two months. Right. Um, you could do something for yourself, go get in the gym. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of different things that people could do to, to better themselves and better their community. It's it's just mm. small things that you can do. And, and if everybody did their part, I think it would be, you know, a, a different space. And I always say people, you know, not necessarily up in arms about this quote, but I always say every man should be responsible for at least one child that's not his. Exactly. I think every if every man would do that, you know, I think our communities would be in a different place um, because every child needs a balance, not just their mom. But they need a father figure also. Um, but, I, you know, again, just doing something, um, even right. if you go buy some food for a couple people and. Yeah. go feed them or right. or even tell guys you know about that quote i'm just like man it's not hard to go make right. friends with a kid's parents you see walking to school every day like hey right. i'll take them to school every day right. i'll pick them up you know and i'll bring them back home and you talk to them every day mentor them it ain't gonna take but an hour or two out your day exactly. you know you can go do that for that kid you know, and right. it'll make a big change in their life mm -hmm. you know you don't know how you're affecting them so and you don't know what they may be going through at home and how you might save them so it's just you know you don't have to do nothing spectacular yeah, I, I, you know? or, or just magnificent or whatever yeah. it's just do something right um don't do nothing don't be sitting on your hands waiting on you know somebody to give you something yeah. like you have to go and do it right that's, that's what i believe in right 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 i think um i think the uniqueness about this interview is number one because i managed you i know so much mm -hmm. right <laughs> but i also think there's so many people who have seen you tell your story mm -hmm. and still only know about 10 percent of your story yep um because I like we live in this this era now where everything kind of lacks context. Mm -hmm. Everything is a headline which lacks context. Right. Everything is a clip from a video, a one minute clip that gets to focus. And you have a lot of taglines and a lot of um, quotes and mantras that you live by that people normally take wrong because mm -hmm. they're only getting it out of context. Exactly. So um, one of the things I really want to get into is kind of breaking down some of your talking points mm -hmm. and, and showing people that the mantra means well. Right. And it doesn't have to be taken personally. Mm -hmm. So, like, you'll say, hey, and you, you know, especially when you get annoyed, you'll be like, you know, 
what are y'all doing? We don't have to do this crap, and men mm-hmm. can do this, and men mm-hmm. can do that. And it's coming from a place of love, but everybody kind of has their persona, so they're fighting back. So one of your quotes is, every man should be uh, responsible for a child that's not theirs. Mm-hmm. So give the background to that, and then I'm going to give you the pushback. Right. So the background to that is I watched the men around me raise the whole neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And um, my uncle, my stepdad, like, we grew up, and we at family dinner, everybody from the neighborhood there, all the boys, all the girls, we invite them over. It didn't cost extra because we grew our food in the, in the yard. Um, we grew everything we ate, so it didn't cost us no extra food. We just go out there and pick it. My stepdad taught all those kids how to grow their own food. He, when we was out there painting cars, he all the boys in the neighborhood came painting cars with us. When the neighborhood crackhead taught us how to build brick mailboxes, Everybody was out there. We all learned how to lay bricks. Like, it was a full neighborhood ordeal. Um, the Deacon Bogan, um, that's the guy's name that stayed behind us. He taught us all how to cut grass and do hedge trimming and all that. Truck driver across the street, he kept us disciplined. Um, the, the guy who used to sell us snack cakes from down the street, like, it was, it was a whole neighborhood ordeal. Like, it, I ain't never seen, like, where men weren't responsible for other kids. Even right now, like, my sons are home with their mom, and she's like, oh, they playing with the kids next door. I'm like, okay, well... Eventually, I'm probably going to start getting them, too, because they're going to be their friend. I need to be having some type of impact on them, too, because they don't have no father at home. I know they don't. I know they don't. So I'm just like, well, maybe I need to, I'm, I'm going to start picking them up, too, and I'm going to talk to their mom so that we can all go to the park together and go, you know, hang out. And I could be putting wisdom in them, too, because I don't know what they're learning at home. Mm-hmm. And I want to make sure if they're talking to my child or affecting my children, you need, I need to know what's going on in your brain, too, because what you don't realize is kids learn a lot from other kids, too. And that's why I don't want my kids to go to regular school because I don't want my children learning anything from any of the kids at school at all. I don't I don't like it. I've watched what happens at school. I watch how children change because they're trying to do what's popular on social media, do what's popular at school and do what's popular to other kids. So I created a school environment where I know what's happening, you know, with the students. I know what they're learning. I know what the environment is like versus in a public school system. It's just complete at this point. Degeneracy There's 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 like. 77% 77% degeneracy and the rest of it is just learning. And the kids aren't learning at school anymore. Um, you go to your regular school and try and talk to a high school kid, they sound insane. You go talk to a kid in middle school and they sound nuts, but you go to elementary school, they sound sophisticated, they sound like they they learn how to read, they're doing all this basic stuff because they're they're vulnerable and they're little kids right now, but they get to middle and high school, they're already talking about sex. You got elementary school kids talking about sex and I don't think they even learn in school no more. They just there and on top of the new technology and stuff like for example at the local high school now all that's happening all day at school is they air dropping porn and air dropping fights and all that i mean it's it's complete degeneracy at school i go there all the time go pick up my brother and every day it's just dumb stuff all day it's no no enrichment at school anymore so i was like well i think we should create our own type of school environments and that's exactly what i did so um, <clears throat> so what do you say to the pushback especially we from Auburn, mm-hmm. right what do you say to the pushback of because while I agree with what you're saying, mm-hmm. I also think that everything is twofold, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you say to the people that say, you're not the only one who know how to do this, mm-hmm. or you're not the only man around that knows how to do this? Like you'll say, I don't want my, my kids learning anything from the kids at school. Mm-hmm. But you don't, while the school might not be perfect, that don't mean it's not other students there who have men in their life that's teaching them some of the same things. Mm-hmm. And what's going to happen is people are going to say, well, your kids are still going to be influenced when they leave you. Mm-hmm. Kids are going to be kids. Mm-hmm. So what do you say about, to those people who say you're not the only one doing stuff just because we're not out here with a, a major platform? Right. Um, for, for one, um, I, I love when people say that because I've never advertised that I was the only person doing anything. I always say that everybody should be doing something. On top of that, I cannot help that I learn how to utilize social media and push myself around. Um, uh, Brother Ben X taught me how to, to do that because I was doing it for a while at one point um, and I wasn't posting a thing and he was like no you need to post what you're doing and it circulated and the reason I am circulating so much is because you don't see it often. You don't see any free boarding schools nowhere. I have yet to see one where they are offering everything for free that's not government funded. You let me know when you find it. Now granted I, I agree with you. There's not there's no I, I don't know of any programs like yours right but then like you know, you have other people who are doing things in the capacity that they could do it. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like the way you're doing it, the way you're structuring your program, the way you're structuring your school is the only model that can work? Nope. Um, I, people have asked me before would I start schools in other places, 
And I always tell them what the program is structured like for Albany may not be what the kids in Philadelphia need. And what the kids in Chicago may need may not be what the kids in Savannah need. Um, these programs are structured, mine in particular is structured for what I see that the children need in the city of Albany. And so the, the idea of the structure is something that I think everybody could use. However, it needs to be tailored for those students uh, and those children in those specific areas. What are those specific students in that specific area struggling in? Sure, the basic routines, you know, like, you know, working out or whatever like that, sure. But as far as the mental, emotional and what they need to learn, et cetera, it, it needs to be tailored for specific students. Um, so that's that's what I believe. I don't think the model itself. Well, I think the, the model itself is universal, but what is specifically put into the model um, I believe, you know, it should be tailored toward what the students and the children need for whatever area they're in. So I'm not going to dominate, but sure, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I think another problem is you speak from a, from a perspective of function. Mm -hmm. And when you speak from a perspective of function, you speak from a perspective of this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. This is what is working. I think a lot of times people, you're not humanized enough for mm -hmm. people to know, like, hey, I mess up too. Mm -hmm. So, like, you started the program in 2019, mm -hmm. started school last year. What did the last, I want to focus on the last year, what did the last year teach you the most about what you needed to work on or what you didn't see? Because mm -hmm. now that the school is open, it's a different beast than when the mm -hmm. program was open and you was raising funds. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people like to f focus on that mm -hmm. and focus on what you're doing. How do you feel about like your performance over the last two years, the year before the school started and the last year? The year before the school started was a hot year um, and the year before that. Um, everything was kind of hot. It was doing good, raising money, et cetera. It's like when the school opened, um, it was it's definitely a different beast. Um, have I learned to figure it out? Yeah, of course. That's what I do. But when it first opened and figuring out staff and figuring out paying everybody and feeding the kids, our bill is like five figures every month. You know, so you're talking about paying the internet, paying the lights, making sure everybody got food, uniforms, haircuts, making sure the mamas are taken care of. We're taking care of my kids, they mom. Like it's, it became a, a lot um, to, to start out. So, but me, of course, I'm going to figure it out, but it's like a lot of stuff I didn't factor in. And then also listening to people in my circle is mainly the women in my circle. Um, and I, and we talk about women's intuition all the time. We, we wholly believe in it. And, you know, at that time I felt like when people were saying some stuff may not be ready or we should wait or whatever like that, it felt like a challenge because everybody's been saying that to me, especially enemies for a while. He shouldn't be doing this. He too, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, when somebody tells me, I don't think this is going to be ready or something, or this, maybe need to push this back or not do that, it's, it looked like a challenge to me. Well, now I'm going to show you it's going to happen anyway, you know, versus actually thinking about what they really were trying to say and it turned out to be true. So I think, should we have pushed back another year? I think so, um, with opening. Um, I would have loved to, to gather up more things, gather the school a little bit more um, as far as physically working on it. Etc. On top of the storm that happened um, and messed us up, and which was crazy because that that one little ten minute storm didn't hurt none of Albany, but two places, our school and that church that it destroyed. Um, it, we were literally in that one little line that this, the storm went in, and um, it was it was a lot that ha that has happened this year, um, and I feel like a lot have, could have gone different. But you know, me and the staff and I have already said, you know, now that we have an idea of what to get a hold on, we're spending this whole summer getting ready for. The following year because um, obviously we're not going to close of course um, and then of course I'm about to take some kindergartners because my son's going to kindergarten and he needs classmates um, but it's been a lot I've learned about myself um, in general and my self-determination and confidence um, a lot of that was shot maybe a couple months ago back in October November December time it was it was it was it was shot I wasn't posting no videos I wasn't talking to nobody it was just a rut because I didn't like what I saw. I'm like, I, I, I appreciate what's happening and the kids are doing well, but it's not what I saw when I saw my school open. And so for me, you know, for other folks, it seemed cool. It looked cool. The kids are there or whatever, but it just wasn't what I envisioned in my head, like the perfection that I saw in my, in my head. So I see that happening in a couple of years, you know, when we figure it all out and, and get the building right and get the right funding, which we're on the way to. Um, but Opening up, first starting out, 
and not seeing what exactly what I envisioned shot my confidence real bad. Um, Which is so, shocking because people probably think you never, you know, you got this, you have this uh, boldness that comes off as boastfulness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just self-determination. But a lot of people wouldn't think you ever lack confidence. People mm -hmm. think, people think when, when you do great stuff or when you speak from a place of vision that you never question the vision. Mm -hmm. You never get depressed. You never feel like mm -hmm. nobody likes you. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's important for people to understand that you went through that period. Oh, yeah. I was ready to shut the school down. I was, I was ready to be like, after Christmas, just then my staff like, nah, let's try to wait till the end of the year. I'm just like, well, I don't want to wait till the end of the year. I'm like, we ain't got no money. I'm like, I'm not raising no money. This is getting tough. I'm, everything's like, it felt like everything was swallowing me at one point. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just like, bro, let's, let's kill all of it right now. Like, we'll open up in two years and go back to after school for right <laughs> now. Like, I was ready to, to kill it all because I'm just like, it's not, nothing's working. Like, it, nothing I was trying to do was working. Nobody I was calling was helping. Like, it was, it, was a, it was a rut. But then, just like I tell my boys all the time, you know, nobody ain't going to feel sorry for you. Um, you have to go make it happen. Sure, they might listen to you. Sure, my son might care that I'm sad, but he still need to eat food. He, he, be I, a I, man I, of it. I can't still be both. Can't be, can't be both. Can't be both. I still need cereal in the morning, Daddy. So I'm glad that you're sad, but we, we <laughs> 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 let's continue. So, but the world still continues, even if you die. The next day, life continues. Um, and I woke up and I just decided to feel better. Um, that was it. I decided to feel better. Literally, I started going to the gym in the mornings. I just started pumping myself back up, and I got myself back together, and stuff started happening. And it it. The reason stuff started happening was because we were doing Bible study with the students and we've still been studying the book of Joshua right now. And it ain't, I mean, and I tell people all the time, you got to believe in the Bible or not, whatever. I don't care. The, the, the stories in there are phenomenal for your life, period. So we were reading the book of Joshua and this was when Moses died and, and Joshua was trying to show the people that God chose him to be the successor of Moses. And everybody like, listen, bro. We love Moses. We don't care about what you're talking about or whatever like that. So God, like, okay, I'm going to have to show them that, you know, you are who I chose. And um, my favorite story about the book of Joshua is crossing the Jordan River. And, and it speaks to why you have to move yourself before God do anything for you. And so just like the people told him they had to cross the Jordan to get, you know, to the promised land or whatever. And he told the people, like, look, I can stop this river or whatever, but you're going to get in it first. So... The river's a raging river, and before I stop the river, you're going to get in it first. Like, I'm not going to – he could easily stop the river before you cross it, but no, you're going you gonna to believe in me, and you're going to do what I ask you to do, and you're going to step first before I do anything. So you can get to the door, but you got to open it, and then God will show you what's on the other side, not just stand there and wait for the door to be open. So they step foot in the Jordan River, the river stops, the river splits. It was so dry that they was able to walk straight across, you know, I mean, do what they needed to do. As soon as they got finished, the river's, river's back. But that story spoke to how I felt a couple months ago. I just had to figure it out. I figured it out and stuff started happening again. Not saying everything's back perfect, but if things are happening to a point where I'm back confident in my ability. I'm, I'm back confident in the school. I'm back confident in the students. I'm back confident in the staff. And also, God has kind of like been dropping people off that ain't got no business being there too and dropping off those negative things too. And it's just been happening. And every day it's just like I wake up like, dang, something good is about to happen. I don't know what it is yet, but... I feel good. And, and when you have that type of energy, you attract that type of energy. So that's what's been happening right now. And I'm, I'm grateful for where we are um, with the school right now. You know, we got field day coming up and we got our little spring camp coming up. We're doing overnight in America. I mean, things, things are looking up for us. And that's just all in how I felt mentally. All that happened just because of how I felt. And I just had to fix it. One thing you said that really stuck out to me, bro, is that um, you said you made a decision. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like making that conscious decision to, you know, wake up and be positive and be happy, you know, getting your, pulling yourself out of that depressed state. Like, so just speak to other people that are, you know, 23, mm -hmm. that are depressed and, and dealing with certain things and know how to get out of it. Like, what advice would you give them? Um, usually the type of advice that I give for any situation like that, it sounds a bit harsh, but it's just straight and direct. No, ain't nobody out here to feel sorry for you. I mean, mm -hmm. God may feel sorry for you for a little bit, but he ain't finna move for you unless you move for yourself. Right. Um, and you got to figure out what your purpose is. And on top of that, if you don't know your purpose, go make some money. Um, and there are plenty of ways to make money in 2023. 
Um, and I honestly feel like right now, if you don't have money, it's because you're choosing not to have money. There are so many different ways to make funds, YouTube, whatever. There are so many different ways to learn things. I honestly think if you don't have any money right now, it's because you choose not to have no money. There's yeah. a thousand outlets to make money. Um, but I say that because you need to get your funds together to fund whatever dream you have. Right, right. You might have to spend two, three years, you know, figuring it out and, and fixing cars or working on somebody's plant to, right. to fund your dream. Because that's right. what I, me and my brother did. Mm. Like to fund the program originally before we had any viral this or that. We was out cutting hair, fixing cars, paying folks' houses. That's Whatever how I, it took. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. how I did field trips and everything. Right. I wanted it, and that's right. what I took. You got to get up and want it. Ain't nobody yeah. going to want it for you. Right. You have to get up and make it happen. You just 23, too? You're right. my age, man? Right, let's so, go. You got plenty of energy. <laughs> yeah. What you sleeping for? For right. what? Exactly. Ain't no reason to sleep. Exactly. You, you got all the energy right now. Your right. back ain't hurting. Your knees ain't hurting. You want to work now so you can play later. And I always tell people, last one, at least, work for your grandkids. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever tells nobody that. Work for your grandkids, because imagine how better your life would be if you thought about the stuff your granddaddy could have did for you. Yeah. So, you know. I want this Benz now. Forget them grandkids. <laughs> you can get the Benz now. <laughs> that's, that's how. Um, <laughs> uh, another thing I want to touch on, too, is, like, I've been looking at situations, and, and you know, I could line them up. I could line up. I'm, a, I'm older than you, clearly. Mm -hmm. well, that's why you can't beat me or nothing. It's but right. <laughs> even, like, going back to Cam Newton, mm -hmm. what I realized is, mm -hmm. um, when we have a moment as black people, or especially as young black people, you start to become the star. Right now is uh, the girl from um, LSU. Mm -hmm. um, then Angel it was, Reese. Angel Reese. Yeah. I'm sorry. Angel Reese, no disrespect, but it's Angel Reese. Then it was, you know, before that it was Shakari, Shakari Richardson. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, before that it was, you know, I can go all the way back to Cam Newton. Mm -hmm. Talk about what it feels like to be the golden child. Oh, boy. At, in one moment, and right after that, you become like the biggest villain target in the world. Yep, I had that Andrew Reese moment, March 23rd, my grandmama's birthday. Oh, was it 2021? Mm -hmm. Yep, I'll never forget it. Um, I had did an interview with Roland um, about two weeks prior, and I remember um, in the middle of the night, Dr. Boyce Watkins did a, a podcast at like 2.30 in the morning, because he had watched the interview and how I was treated on the interview. And um, I woke up that next morning, everything was exploded, um, like from top to bottom, like all my social media, my emails and my staff was just like having they couldn't even go through all the emails. We got thousands of orders um, put in. Like I had to shut the store down. The lady who was doing our orders had to shut her own store down just to fulfill all the orders we had over the course of like four weeks. We raised thousands upon thousands of dollars. Um, for what we were doing, and we were able to buy 40 acres of land, three buildings, our school. Um, it was a lot, and I was on Kelly Clarkson, CNN, Fox, HBO. I was on every major show you could possibly think of. You were there, but <laughs> but I, it was it was nuts. I'm on. I'm talking about. I'm doing. I had did at least 100 to 175 interviews, like in a co course of a month. Um, and I'm talking. About, I'm up at two o'clock in the morning because I'm up on somebody's podcast on the other side of the world, doing podcasts in Australia, Canada, Israel, um, Spain. I'm talking about, and these Everywhere. people, they speak in different languages and everything. Like, it's, it was it was a lot. And I got so burnt out for a little bit. I had to pause for a second, but it was so much happening at one time. And I was it was all love from everybody, Rihanna. I mean, it was, people was in the DM, celebrities, et cetera. And um, you went from there to two years later, it's like now I'm, I'm battling everybody because people don't like my method in how I'm trying to make things happen for my community. And people feel like, well, making themselves feel like that I'm slighting them by trying to do what I'm doing. Um, for example, um, me talking about the do for self thing. Um, and then the other crowd, you know, as far as they want reparations and things like that. I've never said that you shouldn't fight for reparations, never said that those things weren't deserved from black Americans or anything like that. I just said we should do for self. I never you just don't have to wait on it. Right. But they were saying, well, fighting isn't waiting. I'm like, that's you're still waiting. I'm like, even though you are actively doing stuff to try and get it, there's still a waiting period before they say, OK, this is granted. You're, there is waiting to do. What I'm saying is we still can do stuff for our communities immediately right now. You know, uh, as far as helping our children, uh, helping our communities, feeding people, et cetera. Let's do those things. And they're taking it as a slight or saying that 
um, that I'm we're we're gonna hurt the reparations movement by advocating for people helping themselves. I'm just like, so you're telling me that we're purposely not doing anything so that way we could get reparations, but this is almost verbatim what they're telling me. They're like, nah, we shouldn't be doing nothing because the government owes us such and such. And I'm just like, I don't agree with that. And I think I should be able to say that. Then it goes into, oh, well, you got white followers and stuff like that. I'm just like, what is the issue with having white people that support a black movement? I don't care. I'm just like, it's it's fine that they support. I don't have an issue with it. And then um I and I always, you know, make the 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 analogy, I'm just like, well, you say you want reparations and here are white people giving a black cause money. It's not correlating with me. I'm just, right. And then they're like, oh, you just scamming the white people. I'm like, well, if you don't like white people, what is the problem? I'm like, again. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> like, before we go, because that's a tangent, right? Right. And you know me, all y'all know, everything, I got a rap lyric for everything. Mm -hmm. Right? So it, it's two things, though. It's just like Jay-Z said, with the same sword, they knight you. Mm -hmm. They gonna get knight you with. Yep. So what, it, what that means is they're going to get tired of celebrating you way quicker than they're going to get tired of hating you. Mm -hmm. The celebration is 15 minutes. Yep. The hate is 15 years. Yep. Once you get this, and I want people to be very cautious about trying to attain the most attention they can attain. Because yep. yes, attention will bring you bookings, attention will bring you money, attention will mm -hmm. bring you things. But once you get that high, everybody, it's almost psychological. Everybody is like waiting on all right, when we gonna find something to let him know he yeah. ain't better than us no more? All right. But when we gonna find, oh, Andrew Reese, we love you now. You so unapolog unapologetically black until you say you don't like something mm -hmm. or until you don't do nothing. Like and how they did Shakari, you know. It's, it's, it always mm -hmm. happens in, like, wh but what you're saying and what my biggest thing is from watching, even like now that I'm somewhat removed from your day to day. Mm -hmm. I still talk to you every day, but I'm not managing you. Right. But, Nipsey Hussle said, block for me, black man. You know they're trying to stretch us. What you're saying is, hey, there's a team. There's a football team. Mm -hmm. If you're doing, if you're fighting for reparations, you might be the offensive line. Yep. If, I'm, if you're the wide receiver, you might be fighting for voting rights. You might be running that route. Mm -hmm. If I'm the quarterback, I might be fighting for how do we march down the field, which is what I consider what you're doing. So it's a team, and we don't have to put, the, the team can't turn around and fight each other. For no reason at that, especially when I haven't called nobody out, hadn't said nobody's name. It all started from when I said I feel I felt convicted that after reading Booker T. Washington's book of from slavery, that a slave, a former slave can read and write better than me. It's 2023. There is no reason that a former slave have wrote books way more eloquent than any of us right now in 2023. There's, that makes no sense. He taught himself how to read, taught himself how to write. He read a dictionary, etc. I can't do that in 2023. We got Google, computers and everything, and we can't get up and go take some kids and teach them how to read. These kids don't even know how to say their name half the time. And much less can know how to read. Our reading scores are abysmal in the black community. That's not, okay, we could blame part of it on poverty and blame it on, you know, what it, but I don't think that at the end of the day, there are free libraries everywhere. Why aren't we getting together and sending our kids to the library? Why aren't we getting our clicks together and figuring it out? We can get clicks together to go talk about reparations on Twitter. I mean, we can make three like spaces on Twitter to talk about who's a cat, who's a coon and who ain't. Y'all saying people could go be finding some kids in your neighborhood right now while you talk about me in a space. You can go be teaching those kids how to read and write or go teach them the things you say I should be teaching my kids. Well, you go take some kids and teach them yourself. Do you, you know? think it, do you think, and it's Caleb too, do you think Delivery is more important than mm -hmm. what you're saying, cause like I don't. Sh everybody has their role, mm -hmm. right? Caleb is a phenomenal director and can do everything production wise, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like I can go to Caleb and say, "Hey, bro, I want. I know you want to shoot it like this. What you think about this?" Mm -hmm. Caleb can come to me and say, "Hey, bro, we might need to move this person, or we might need to." change this do you think it's because how you say mm -hmm. stuff or is it just some people just don't want to be a team i have extended all the branches i have tried to talk nice you know i was cookie cutter for a while you know <laughs> being super certain tie and trying to be cool like listen we could all fight together and i could bring my kids to come meet you guys and all that and it's still met with all of this well you can come to my school and come to all of this you know so when but when i snap back or whatever, then everybody really got a problem because I, I decided to raise my voice or speak with a little, you know, more boldness or talk with a little bit more confidence because I'm got tired of I'm trying to 
to ta- yeah and tailor my message like because now everybody mad about how I you know responded. I'm just like I didn't even respond in a bad way. I just named everybody and told them that I, this mouthpiece that I have is gonna be for me. And I'm going to say what I believe. And no, it's not nobody's talking points. It's not pandering to nobody. This is stuff granddaddy said and grandmama said. I ain't telling this because just because they may agree don't mean that, oh, this is my base that I'm pandering to. I've been saying the same stuff since I was 18, 19. People still have these old videos of me when I was 18, 19, only talking to the conscious black community, saying the same exact things. The message never changed. I was in Dr. Boyce's you know, conventions and talking to the Dr. Umars of the world or whatever, and that's what I was doing, talking to the Nation of Islam, whatever, saying the same things. But as soon as I get on Twitter and say it, but because there may be some white people who agree, now I'm a grifter and a coon. I'm just like, guys, like I've been saying this stuff for years. So there's no way to tailor the message. I told somebody yesterday, and Brother Bennett said the same thing. He said, you can say anything. You can say the sky is blue and somebody going to spin it. That's what media does. It's the most effective devil in America. That's what Maj Ture says. And no matter what you say, people are going to spin it. When, when this comes out, people are going to spin this. They're going to put it on YouTube and put shorts up. King Randall, like the other day, the one video I did make, they got on there. King Randall destroyed the FBA community. I'm like, I, I did not destroy them. I just simply said, this is my mouthpiece, but they're going to clip it up how they want to, and that's just the game. So I just say what I have to say. I, I'm going to say this, bro. So... Look at it like a you know a pie, if you will. Mm-hmm. You got ten percent of people who are gonna love you. Mm-hmm. That just they, regardless of what you're doing in life, they're gonna love you. Ten mm-hmm. percent of people who are gonna hate you. Then you got another eighty percent who are gonna be in between. Just focus on the eighty percent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The ten percent on either side, good or bad, they don't matter, bro. Yep. They gonna be who they are regardless. So whatever you say, do you know? Jump, kick, scream, whatever. They yep. still gonna be there. Just focus on the eighty percent. Mm-hmm. So I agree with that. And, you know, we're going to close it out. But I do want to get into, we talked about the school, we talked about everything, and young young men for war. You got all this passion. Mm-hmm. What scared you? <laughs> Being scared itself. And, and I think me and you talked about that before because people always, like, talk to me and be like, why you, like, want to do stuff? Like, I want to wrestle an alligator and, and go skydiving <laughs> and all this stuff. I don't be caring. I'm like, I'm not scared. I'm like, I'm scared of being you scared. Haven't. I can't. No, like, no. I, I wish. Yeah, but I don't hey, know. Hey, look, no, you know. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, the ladies love it anyway. I thought I cut, cut my hair. They was just like, shoot, we like that better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but nah, man. I, I really, I don't know what I'm scared of. Like, for real. I I heard this, this quote from this minister, um, and he talked about how that all animals have a natural fear of the human. Every single animal on the earth from the elephant to the ant. And they have a natural fear of the human because they know who the human is. Remember, we were granted dominion over the earth. And so when an animal smells fear, they understand that you don't know who you are. If you go to any class they give you on how to defend yourself against a bear or a mm-hmm. lion or whatever, like that, they're like, just act big. Don't be scared. Don't run. Be scared. Just scream at it. You know, back up and it'll go away. But if you try and run or you act scared or whatever like that, then, oh, this don't, they don't know who he is. So and then the easiest way to see that is a dog. Yeah. Dogs, they smell. If you don't act scared with a dog, they are not going to try you. Just don't be scared. Like, you are bigger than it, even though it can outrun you. I will kill a dog because I'm not scared of you. Like, that's how you Please operate. don't kill a dog, boy. You'll, never, you'll go viral oh, for yeah. real then. Straight Michael Please. B. Please <laughs> don't kill a dog. Yeah. But that's just. Be out of here. But yeah, that's just how I was raised. Like, I, I just. I, I'm not scared of death. Like, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Like, I'm, I can't run from it, so I'm going to go on cruises. I'm going to skydive. I'm going to do whatever, you know, because if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Are you scared of being alone? What do you mean? In your personal life? Um, yeah. And I wouldn't say scared. I don't want to be alone. I don't think anybody wants to, but mm-hmm. I, think there's a, I think there's people who have a healthy fear of it, mm-hmm. and then there's, a people, there's people who have a, like, a paranoid fear of it. Nah, I, I can be alone. I don't have an issue with that. But however, I would prefer and want a woman with me at all times. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. I, 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 it, it generally in my life, absolutely. Um, that's, again, because of how I was raised. I didn't see the men in my life be most effective unless they had a woman around them. So it's like I feel like, all right, now, I need intuition around me. Like, that's, that's what I believe in. If, if, if a woman called me, it's Mari or, or whoever, my mom, 
and they like, hey, I don't feel too good about this trip you about to go on. Like that, probably gonna cancel it. Why? Because of women's intuition. I don't know what God done told or put in their system of spirit or whatever, so I'm gonna go. I have to have women in my life. You know, my mom, grandma, Mari, whatever, they gonna, they gonna be there. Um, Cause that's that's what I believe in, and definitely having a spouse. So you know I'm gonna poke you a little bit. Right? Come on, talk to me. I already knew this was coming. So, <laughs> with that being said, mm -hmm. you're going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. You don't talk about it. Nope. For for reasonable reasons. Mm -hmm. How does that how does that line up with what you just said? One. Mm -hmm. How does it? And you saying now you've been saying a lot that you won't get married to the state again. Mm -hmm. And on top of that. Why does why is it that that part of your that didn't does that feel worse than when you felt like you was losing your school from a failure standpoint? Not necessarily. Um, only reason I felt like a failure is because my family instructed against it um, originally. Um, they were supportive, but they instructed against it, and I'm big on my counsel, um, and they all instructed. You listen to me. No, don't listen to you. Though. You know, but um, they they instructed against it, and um, that's where I felt like a failure. And the reason I kept at it as long as I did was because I was trying to prove to them that nah, this was gonna work, even though y'all you know didn't believe in it, this was gonna work. Um, but they weren't necessarily in opposition to it happening. It was in opposition to who it was with, um, and just not being equally yoked, not being raised the same. Um, I don't take anything away from her, you know, but I don't think we just we just weren't a good pair. Sure, she's going to say all this other stuff about things I did or whatever like that. That's not why things ended. I ended things. Um, I filed because I thought it was the best thing to do for our children. Um, the bickering and fighting, et cetera, you know, I just it was always like that. It was never a bliss moment. Um, it was always like that. Because was, a lot of people will say, and I'm, mm -hmm. this is not to take you and her specifically out of it. Sure. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will say, you got hot and changed. Mm -hmm. and, and she'll she'll try and say that too. Um, but there were things, you know, previously that happened within the marriage that of course I would not speak about that I did not like and I felt like I, it, it was time for me to go then. Um, but I didn't. And I tried to make it work again and out came William, my second mm -hmm. son. Um, so, you know, without getting into any specifics. Don't do that. Yeah, I'm not going to get into any specifics, but I don't, it's just certain stuff that I wish would have happened or I wish would have been better, and it never happened, and I just decided to go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off and, and, and end it. Um, and, and honestly, I think right now, um, we both believe that it was the best decision. Um, would she probably have liked for it not to end? Probably so. But, you know, being a man at the end of the day, I had to make that final decision. I'm like, I don't think this is best for us or the children, and I think we'll better get along apart. Um, and that's you, where we are. Do you think being a public figure makes the relationship that you want harder or easier um, in your next relationship or getting that next relationship? Um, I ain't A-list or B-list status yet, I'll say. Um, I moved down to C-list after the, the big hubbub, um, of course, two years ago. I didn't, I didn't, keep, I didn't keep the traction. I, I stopped because I was doing stuff. But um, I wouldn't say it's completely hard right now because I ain't there yet. Um, Cause everybody don't know who I am. I will say that, but it is a little bit tougher because you is trying to figure out who actually there for you for real, or who see the fame and like, oh snap, or I got a little bit more money than a normal person or whatever like that. So it's like trying to figure out who's there and who ain't, and also just looking at being equally yo. I'm, I'm just, I've just went back to what I was taught. Now it's like I don't even give nobody no time of day. If you ain't had a full family like I had, I ain't even talking to you. All right, cool. You ain't got no daddy, no bye. You know, it's just like that, that's how quick it is. Um, I don't want to talk to you. It's like if, if we're not equally yoked to start out, if our visions don't align, if our visions don't marry, there's nothing much for us to keep discussing. Like that's that's how fast it is now because I don't have time to, to, to waste time. I do wish to have a family and be married and all that stuff like that. So I don't have no time to waste with trying to figure it out. It's a thin line between judgment and discernment. Mm -hmm. And that's true. I think it's, it's, you can't learn the difference until you go through a lot of stuff. Yep. And you can't change anything until mm -hmm. you go through a lot of stuff because as to be in tagline, to be a change agent, you have to be two things. You have to be inspired and you have to be aware. Yep. You have to, being inspired is a gift. God is going to send inspiration. The devil is going to send inspiration. You're going to mm -hmm. always have inspiration. But you have to be aware of when you're inspired, what you're inspired by, 
and how do you respond to it? Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, to close this out um, from, from my side, I'm not sure if Caleb had other questions is, I want to give you not your flowers for what you're doing. I, we do that. I do that every day. You get that from it. Mm-hmm. I want to give you flowers for becoming more aware that number one, things ain't black and white like like it might come off in 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 cliche points or talking right. points. But because now you have to realize that on an everyday basis, you have to go back and do audit of yourself. Mm-hmm. You your first twenty years, you audited the world. Now you have to audit yourself. You don't have to do that in public. You don't have to audit your family and all of these different things in public. But I'm proud of you from the standpoint of I seen you go real high. Mm-hmm. I seen you go real low. And I seen, for the most part, nobody pull you back to the middle. Mm-hmm. That's a decision you have to make. And that's a decision that everybody has to make. Yep. You just so happen to be doing it with another 45 lives depending on you. So mm-hmm. that's a tough thing. And, and, you know, I admire that. And I appreciate it. Yeah. Likewise, bro. Like. Bro, it, it takes a lot of courage to be fully vulnerable. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Just not in not only the space that you're in, but just any space. Like in 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 the um in the public eye. It's just like, bro, like it's crazy just like when you really look at it from like a bird's eye view, you know what I'm saying? Like what you're doing, what we're doing, is Yes, it's great. It looks good. Mm-hmm. It's, it's it's fun and things like that. But like, you know, the life that you had before is totally gone, yep. and that's what people don't really can't really, get it back. Can't get it back. That's mm-hmm. what people don't really take into account. Like that's that's what the loss really is. Like what life you may knew before is mm-hmm. not is not that no more. It's it's always gonna be changed. Ain't never gonna be that again. It's like <laughs> having to go to the store with a hat on. Yeah. And, and, not being able to say this or post right. that or go here. Like yeah. it's, it's annoying. It, 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 it's, it's a lot, bro. It, it, it get you annoying know. sometimes. People be thinking they want to have a little fame with somebody they know them. I'm like, bro, it's it's not what you think it is. It's people not, people got this magnifying glass on you. Like, on even, everything. Yeah, even like with me talking on Twitter, people just like, oh, people going to try to dig up this stuff on you. I'm like, look, bro, I'm on a thousand women. Yeah. I done paid for abortion. We did, listen, we let's go down the list. I'll go down it with you. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I'm honest with my students, too. Like, yeah. it's, it's a lot of stories that you know, of course, the public, I don't know, but I've told my students, like, so when y'all decide to come out or whatever, my, my kids are like, bro, Mr. King already talked to us about this. Yeah. And we've already been through this this whole thing. I right. mean, anybody could, with with a brain that has common sense, you got a 21-year-old kid that's handsome, that's all over TV, et cetera. What you think happening? Like, so, look, look what's, what you think happening? Let's be real. So, so like, in, in the real way, bro, like, it just takes a lot of courage to just go through that, bro, mm-hmm. like, and to deal with that. So, again, I just want to commend you with that. I appreciate um, it. Yep. The last thing I do want to talk about, you know, and, and just to make this whole thing full circle, we do have like a lot of people that's watching from Albany, sure. surrounding cities and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Talk to us about what a typical day looks like for a student. Hmm. Yeah, so, um, but from the beginning, um, I guess I'll start there. Uh, the kids every day, yeah. about six, seven o'clock, they wake up in the morning. Classes okay. start at nine. Gotcha. So we'll get them up early in the morning. Um, we'll do breakfast. Yeah. Um, after they do exercising, um, just basic breakfast, eggs, yeah. whatever, Mario cook. We'll figure it out. Or cereal, depending, gotcha. you know, um, what yeah. we decide to do that morning. Um, but I don't, personally, I don't believe in breakfast. I don't think that's a proper <laughs> meal. I don't. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but yeah, anyway, they'll eat breakfast. Uh, then after that, they'll go to their classes. Um, they do their classes during the day, do lunchtime, of course. Um, after lunch, they do their afternoon classes, probably get out about 3 o'clock, 3.30. Um, we do afternoon activities, go play in the gym, martial arts classes, and whatever other classes we'll have, people come and teach them, um, or changing the oil, or whatever like that, just just stuff they're doing every day. But mm-hmm. in the morning, because they got to brush their teeth, and make their bed, and get iron their uniforms, that's what they were doing at the beginning, of course, before we had to um, leave the facility. Um, and then, of course, in the evening time, you know, we square them away, Get ready for bed, take showers, and hit the hay. That was it. Then gotcha. repeat the next day. Probably about nine o'clock, they was in the bed. Yeah. And we repeat the next day. Um, and of course, depending on if we did field trips or what have you. Right now, they're going home every day, and they come at about eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and it's almost the same. And I do Bible study in the evening times on on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Mm. Um, we got a couple field trips coming up or whatever like that. So, but next year we'll get back into boarding. Uh, we just had to stop it right now um, because we had an issue at our boarding house. Um, that happened with some plumbing issue, but we just we just decided like it's only a month or two left. So yeah, just, yeah. Like, just 
keep them, they finna go home for the summer anyway. Right. You know, yeah. but they, they, and they, kids are doing fine, man. Um, mm. You know, we got one kid, he's really struggling with reading. Um, he, he's reading on the second grade level. You know, so it's like hard trying to catch him way up, like from basically not knowing how to read at all. Um, so it's, it's been tough trying to catch him up. But other than that, the students are doing well. They've progressed so much since they've been there. Yeah. Our kids who was fat and sloppy, they are have <laughs> lost all their weight. Like that's that's they called kids fat. And sloppy. They was fat and sloppy, and I tell them the same thing. And I don't. I I I told parents when they got there, they would not remain like this. I told them that honestly, and that's and that's how direct we needed to be with that because I don't. I personally believe a child abuse, abuse to allow a child to become obese. I think it's child abuse. Why did you sit there and allow that child to eat and consume that much food to become fat? That's ridiculous. This, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. If you don't mm-hmm. discipline your kids in their behavior, you're not going to discipline in their eating. You're not going to do mm-hmm. none of that. Nope. And and that's and that's where we are. And that's that's where I was with that. But yeah. La- la- last two questions. Mm-hmm. And and again, this is just to draw people to the sure. school, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, how are you? tracking their progress are you doing like you know before and after photos like before and after assessments things like that Mm -hmm. and then also um you know where can they register where can they you know become a student so registration is closed uh as of right now okay i only have it open for kindergartners um, at the moment okay um because i have kids coming in for to be classmates with my son okay um so i do have kindergartners coming in but um at the beginning of the year we did full all their weights we do have beginning of the year photos etc so I'm going to, we're doing end of the year photos next. So I'm going to release pictures of the students from when they came to, to now. And it's, it's drastic drastically different. Drastically different, yeah. Uh, so we're going to release some of those photos and then talk about how their grades, I'm going to have their parents going to talk about what their grades were looking like before and, and how much their kids have progressed now. Mm. Also asking, you know, their parents um, in different interviews, like what was happening at home before, what's happening now. Like those type of assessments are going to do with the parents, yeah. essentially, just to show like how the programs work. And of course, Georgia Milestones come out. We've been working hard for, for that for the past two weeks. And yeah. This next week, we're drilling down on Georgia Milestones. So next week, we get super high scores, you know, in Georgia Milestones. Yeah. So people can see, like, nah, we we working. Right. So Actually um, learning. Yeah, that's that's the that's the that's the goal. Um. So, but that's kind of like what we'll be doing for okay. tracking progress. Dope. Dope. I got a last one, school question. He had, he had one more question. He gave you answer both. He didn't ask two. <laughs> he, said, so he said last two questions. Go ahead. You had one more. He said, how are you tracking progress and what are they registering? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's, it. that's, that's, that's it. That's it. That's okay. It. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, thought it was all, <laughs> I thought it was like one. Right. Right. Whatever. Last question, school-wise. Mm-hmm. Why did you decide not to do charter? Ah. <laughs> um, a lot of people ask why I didn't do charter, um, and we had this conversation. I'm not sure if you were there. Were you there at the charter school board meeting that, that we went to? Mm-mm. No. It was me, Alex, and... I did the virtual one, the phone one. I didn't come okay. to the other one. Okay, we, we worked really hard. Uh, me and Travis, I remember we were on a plane at about in the middle of the night, um, and we were getting emails from the Charter School Association trying to get that application in. But once I met with the Charter School Association, um, they told me that I couldn't guarantee boarding, and I couldn't guarantee certain things happening, et cetera. And, of course, I was already a big proponent of, of them not being able to tell me what's happening with my curriculum. And that's why I just I simply decided that it was just in my best interest and in, in what I wanted to see for it not to happen. Um, sure, it would have been cool and to have the money that they were going to give and have 150 kids and the whole nine and have a big, beautiful school and all that, like on TV and all that. I would have rather had my nine students that I got now versus that 150 because I wanted to see those children actually being developed. Um, sure, they could be learning better or whatever like that, but I want to see their whole lives change, not their grades. Um, and that's why I didn't decide to go charter. I, I firmly believe in, like I said before, fighting for young black men before they die, not while they're dead. And just sending them to school, it's not going to cut it for me. And I think that's important because not even just with you, with fund, people who have nonprofits and people who raise funds, a lot of times people start to think or they try to put the narrative on whoever is leading it that all you care about is money. Mm-hmm. Just for the record, it's half a million dollars in guaranteed money every year that you would have got. Without having to ever ask for another donation. On top of them renovating the On building. On top of everything. them renovating the building or even building a brand new building because mm-hmm. we, we had those talks. Yep. And I just think that's important because you still chose your vision and these kids over the money and the guaranteed attention. It would have been easy, even with the school system. Um, what they were offering at the beginning, they offered to do all the school buses, pay all the teachers, pay for the food. Pay for the this and because that. the grant is there. Yeah, they they offered to pay for all that. I refused again because it was not what I wanted to see, and I didn't want anybody dictating the curriculum at all. 
And on top of that, what they were saying that we couldn't operate a, you know, a charter school or a private school out of the building unless they taught the curriculum. I'm like, no, that's not what's happening. My, what I wanted to happen was more important. I would, have, I would rather raise money all day and keep begging for money than y'all give me money and I don't see what I want to see happen. That wasn't happening. So that's why I decided to turn down the charter and that's why I decided to turn down the school system. Um, that just is what it is. So yeah, people are, oh, you just, you looking for money. Yeah, we, we do we need money. Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to fundraise and yeah, we're going to reach out to people. Yeah. I'm going to post what we're doing all the time. Yeah. Cause we need, we need the funds. But like I said, I'd rather have my nine students versus 150 or 200 or having a brand new school that's not teaching kids what they need. It's, it looks great. Giving the kids new MacBooks at school looks awesome. Can they read? When last time they picked up a pencil? Like, let's, let's be for real. So, and they getting eleven, twelve thousand dollars per kid. Imagine and, me getting that. And, you know, the fact that you're still, like, you wouldn't even go back and change that. Nope. And, you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's definitely not about me. It's about the kids. But I, I've seen, we, over the course of last year, it's been times where you had zero dollars in the account. It's been zero dollars. It's been Neg- time, negative money. It's been times where we had to figure out creative ways or go in savings and bonds and do things so the school could just stay open to the next month. And, mm-hmm. you know, God always delivered a blessing. So I just think it was Every important to, uh, to explain why you didn't take that money. Mm-hmm. And I think, man, 10 years from now, there's going to be a whole lot of people that say, I was always with King Rand. Mm-hmm. Well, I was always... And I'm going to be pulling up them Twitter receipts real always, quick. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the people where to find you, man. Uh, you can find me on all social media platforms. You got something? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm tell good. people where to find you. Yeah, you can find me on all social media platforms at New Emerging King. That's across all social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, at New Emerging King. Website is thexforboys.org, T-H-E-X-F-O-R-B-O-Y-S.org. And if you can't find me on either of those, you can just type King Randall in Google. Um, if you can't find me on there, um, I don't think it's meant for you to be able to find me. Um, it's not in God's plan. Um, but if you can find me on all those other things, it should be fairly easy for you. And I look forward to having your support. Thank you. Look for the big <laughs> smile and the, the bald head. Yep. <laughs> all right, y'all. Let's change agents with King Randall. This is Caleb again. I'm Trav. All right, we y'all. Out. We got. We out.